Thank you for uh, having me. And uh, I mean, it would be much nicer uh, if that could have been in person, but it's uh, uh, given the pandemic, we are used to this uh, hybrid mode of participation. Uh, what I will do in the next uh, um, 20, uh, 20 minutes is to discuss the new uh, developments on uh, um, uh, the management of heart failure in light of um, all the uh, trials that came up, um, came along during the past uh, few years and uh, the guidelines of the uh, uh, Heart Failure Association of the uh, European Society of Cardiology. Now, if we look at what has changed in uh, the new uh, guidelines uh, compared to the previous ones, we see that uh, um, uh, on top we have uh, the 2016 guidelines and the main change was in uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, heart failure with uh, what it was called uh, um, uh, mild range, mid-range ejection fraction that is now is uh, referred to as mildly reduced uh, ejection fraction. But you also can see that there are some very slight changes on the definition that now encompasses patients with uh, 11 trigular function between 41 and 49 percent. But what we also did was uh, to uh, delete the requirement for uh, the uh, elevated uh, levels of natriuretic peptides or re relevant structural heart disease because if there's a, a patient has 11 trigular ejection fraction less than 50 percent, that is clearly an um, heart failure. Uh, this definition has to be taken into the context of also the universal definition of uh, uh, heart failure. That is truly an universal because it's uh, you can see that together with the HFA, uh, then we have the Heart Failure Society of America, the Japanese Heart Failure Society, the Canadian and uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, together with the Heart Failure Association of India and the Chinese. So this and in, uh, a universal definition of uh, heart failure. And uh, you can see that together with uh, patients with reduced ejection fraction, mildly reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction, we have included these uh, new categories uh, of patients with um, heart failure, that is heart failure with improved ejection fraction. These are patients with um, a baseline 11 ventricular ejection fraction less than 40 that had a more than 10% increase in, in their 11 ventricular ed uh, ejection fraction with a second measurement greater than 40%. This is very important. It's important because often we've, uh, we've seen that uh, patients with heart failure or patients who had uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction was stopped uh, and were, uh, I mean, in, uh, the, 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 they had their medication stopped and uh, that led to an increase in mortality and morbidity. And also, there's been the TRED HF study that demonstrated that in patients with heart failure, stopping cardiac medications lead to an increase in uh, heart failure hospitalizations and mortality. This is why it's important to highlight that if you have a patient with a heart failure with improved ejection fraction, then that uh, patient is a patient that needs to be treated as a patient with a heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Then you may remember the old uh, ESC guidelines, the 2016 guidelines, that were suggesting a stepwise approach to the treatment of heart failure, starting with an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker first, then if a patient was still symptomatic and at 11 trigular ejection fraction less than 35%, uh, add an MR antagonist. And then if still asymptomatic, uh, um, switch the ACE inhibitor to an army or start with um, IVABRIL. But in the past, uh, say, six, eight years, we had a lot of uh, trials that basically demonstrated a benefit of uh, starting uh, cardiac medications even after the uh, and immediately after the hospitalizations and together. So we have uh, a wealth of the data coming uh, from the soloist HF and produced and DAP HF mostly that basically demonstrated the clear and central role of the SGLT2 inhibitors in the treatment of heart failure. Then we had other evidence, one from uh, with Verisiwat, with Omicamptiv Mercabil, and also the Affirm HF that confirmed the effect of uh, uh, ferricarboximaltose. Uh, what is important is that in the uh, in this after the paradigm HF, we didn't have any further evidence 
tests for uh, the army in uh, patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction and the Paradise, Paradise MI trial that compared ramipril with sacubitril valsartan basically did not demonstrate any different did, did not demonstrate any difference in uh, uh, mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure between uh, the two drugs. So, uh, the circuitry um, uh, satan is not superior, at least in patients with an ischemic left ventricular dysfunction to, uh, uh, to ramipril. But what was the big change and what led to a very significant change in practice was uh, where, where there have been the results of the um, DAPA HF and Emperor reduced. These are the two studies conducted with uh, Emperor Glyphosin and uh, DAPA Glyphosin in patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction. You can see that the DAPA HF compared, uh, uh, the compared uh, DAPA Glyphosin with placebo showed a significant uh, uh, 25% reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and uh, um, mortality. And what is important is that this, uh, the um, benefit started very early uh, uh, after the initiation of the medication. Similar data were uh, demonstrated with um, uh, uh, and uh, but the main difference is that patients uh, in the uh, DARPA-HF clearly demonstrated a mortality benefit, a reduction in death from all causes that was not seen with empagliflozin. Uh, so we have the very strong data from DAPA-HF that demonstrated a significant uh, reduction in mortality and morbidity, a reduction in death from cardiovascular causes, but also a, a reduction in death from all causes. What is important also is that uh, the DAPA HF demonstrated that the DAPA glyphosin has no, uh, no significant effect on blood pressure. You may see that uh, there are some patients who have, uh, say, four millimeters of mercury of decrease in blood pressure, but these are patients who that start with a blood pressure greater than 130 millimeters of mercury. Where, where patients where we should be more uh, careful about blood pressure decrease are those patients with a blood pressure less than 110 millimeters for mercury. And as you can see in these patients, there was less than one millimeter in a cha uh, of change in uh, blood pressure. So basically no change in blood pressure suggesting that this medication can be given uh, at patients with any blood pressure value. And you can see that the primary outcome was similarly reduced in uh, patients ac according to the different uh, blood pressure values. See significant reduction even in those patients where you see the uh, dapagliflozin was started at a, a systolic blood pressure at, of 90 millimeters of mercury. Similar effect on cardiovascular death, on hospitalizations for heart failure, and all cause death. So a clear and strong benefit. Uh, furthermore, the DAPA HF demonstrated that DAPA glyphosin is very effective on in worsening heart failure and uh, in reducing more worsening heart failure and mortality. There was a 25% reduction in, in the combined uh, uh, endpoint, but there was uh, a 30% reduction in uh, hospitalization for heart failure or urgent heart failure visits that basically demonstrates that there is a 30% reduction in, in those patients who worsen the heart failure. Uh, we discussed already a 20% reduction in cardiovascular death, but also, and what is important, is a reduction, 17%, reduction from death from any cause, not just cardiovascular death, but death from any uh, any cause. This effect was uh, obtained regardless of the level of uh, glycated hemoglobin, was uh, uh, present in patients with uh, diabetes, but also was present in uh, the large population of patients without diabetes, without any difference in the, according to the baseline glycated uh, hemoglobin. Uh, with uh, uh, I, I discussed already the importance of uh, dapagliflozin or all cause death. This was uh, a 17 percent reduction. Was very important. Was not observed with um, the empagliflozin. So this is a, a, a true effect and specific effect of dapagliflozin that reduced mortality 
uh, by 17 percent. The fact that this is not a play of chance is um, has been uh, 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 shown by the DAPA CKD. There is a, was a study where patients were with CKD and diabetes were um, randomized to DAPA gliflozin or placebo, and you can see that the the study demonstrated a forty percent reduction in uh, EGFR decline or cardiovascular death. But what was important a thirty one percent reduction in all cause mortality. So the effect of DAPA gliflozin on all cause mortality is a very, very solid and uh, uh, has been shown in patients with heart failure, patients with CKD, with diabetes, patients with uh, CKD and heart failure. Of course, the, uh, the DAPA-HF and uh, the AMP reduced were uh, conducted in patients with chronic heart failure. Then the soloist WHF with uh, sotagliflozin, uh, another SGLT2 inhibitor, were con was conduct uh, basically was conducted in patients who had uh, um, suffered an episode of worsening heart failure, and they were ready to be discharged or immediately after discharged. And uh, they demonstrated that sotagliflozin was effective in reducing very early by day. Um, 28, the uh, event rate in uh, these patients. So it confirmed the effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so the soloist HF uh, was conducted only in patients with uh, diabetes and heart failure. So there is a difference between uh, uh, the population of patients studied by its soloist and those by DAPA-HF and AMPRO reduced, where, uh, that basically were a larger patient population, but also what is important extends the importance of starting the SGLT2 inhibitors as soon as possible, even in hospital after uh, before discharge. Uh, the, uh, the 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 soloist was conducted in patients with slightly different. We said that there were diabetics, but also had a left ventricular ejection fraction greater than over fifty percent, and you can see that the study demonstrate and suggested that there could could have been an effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors in uh, patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. And we will see later the effect of emperor preserved study. Alongside uh, the uh, the uh, and after the SGLT2 inhibitor trials, then there were a few other trials that demonstrated the benefit of other drugs in heart failure. This was the Victoria study with Carissi watch that demonstrated an eight uh, percent uh, um, uh, ten percent reduction in. Uh, the primary um, outcome of hospitalizations and mortality in patients with uh, heart failure that was uh, associated with uh, a reduction in uh, mortality and uh, um, a death from uh, heart failure that were significant. Of course, this was obtained in a population of patients that was different because where patients were ready to be discharged after an acute event and uh, uh, with a drug that is a soluble vanillate cyclase activator. Um, uh, the, the, the effect size was, uh, uh, in a way, smaller than what we, would, uh, we, what we have seen with the SGLT2 inhibitors. And one important point was that uh, it uh, demonstrated, the, the uh, Verisiwa demonstrated a significant effect in those patients with uh, a B, an anti-pro BNP below uh, 5,000, uh, 5, but in those with a BNP, uh, anti-pro BNP greater than 5,000 showed no efficacy. The problem is that it's not uh, the drug that is not effective is the fact that uh, uh, when patients with uh, high NT pro BNP probably are patients who are not ready to be discharged, are patients who are not ready to be started on oral medications and be sent back home. So basically, the message we need to get from Victoria is that the uh, very what was effective in reducing mortality and morbidity, but for the very what as for any other drug, we have to think that before starting and before discharging patients, we have to see a patient dry, patients other ad patients adequately um, compensated. Another uh, trial that came uh, was the Galati with omet Merkabil, 
and uh, the the, uh, uh, the study basically demonstrated that the myosin activator, so is an inotrope, uh, the omicante of Macabil, was effective in reducing by eight percent the um, uh, the combined endpoint of uh, uh, heart failure and hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. Again. Uh, data that are much less uh, impressive of the data we have seen with the SGLT2 inhibitors. And what is important is that omicamptive Nurkabil demonstrated a good efficacy in those patients with a median left ventricular ejection fraction below 30%. Patients that often are difficult to be treated where an inotrope can be very useful. Uh, after uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, these studies, the last study that was in all, uh, conducted with the Affirm HF study where ferric carboxymaltose was given to patients with uh, heart failure with a recent hospitalization. And uh, the study was just shy of the, uh, demonstrating uh, benefit with, uh, you can see, uh, a p-value of 0.059, so it was not uh, uh, significant, but there was a, a, um, a clear trend toward reduction in events in hospitalizations for heart failure and death in, um, with uh, ferric carboxy maltose. The, there was a main problem with um, the um, Affirm AHF because the study was conducted uh, during, uh, in part, during the pandemic. And therefore, there was this uh, pre-COVID sensitivity analysis that basically uh, censored all patients that had an event after uh, Mar March 3rd, 2020, uh, that we, we know was the, the date when uh, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. After that uh, uh, date, any hospitalization, any death that were in patients with a positive swab for COVID-19 was regarded as related to COVID-19. So, uh, by censoring this, uh, this, um, uh, the study up to March 13, it was uh, uh, a way of being sure that only patients with a, a real cardiovascular event were included and adjudicated. And uh, basically, the study demonstrated with this analysis, that is a postdoc analysis anyway, a 25% reduction in total heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death, an effect that was mainly driven by an effect in, uh, on uh, uh, heart failure hospitalizations. So, what was the evidence that we had for since 2016 when we drafted the guidelines? So, there was evidence for empagliflozin and tapagliflozin to reduce mortality and hospitalizations in patients with heart failure with and without diabetes. Then sotagliflozin produced the mortality and morbidity in diabetic, in diabetic patients with heart failure after an hospitalization. We had no new data for it with circuitous valsartan, and we had very similar tenomic amptipnacabil that demonstrated a mild effect on uh, mortality and morbidity. But we have to say that at the time when we um, uh, um, uh, had sent the, guideline, uh, the guidelines into press, the omegamptip mercabil was not on the market in any country worldwide, and for this reason was not included in the guidelines. So this is uh, the classes of recommendation for the guidelines. So we have a 1A recommendation for the ACE inhibitors, beta blocker, MRA, and dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. These are the only, the only SGLT2 inhibitors to be recommended in patients with heart failure. These drugs are re uh, recommended to reduce the risk of hospitalizations and mortality. Then we have circuitry balsartan that is a, uh, as a class 1B recommendation as a substitution to an ACE inhibitor in patients who are still symptomatic despite a full dose of an ACE um, inhibitor. There is also a 2BB recommendation for uh, very CWAT in uh, patients who had a recent hospitalization. And this is how uh, the algorithm looks like. So basically, we need to start all our patients on the four pillars of ACE inhibitors are in those patients who are already on a, a full dose of ACE inhibitor, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Then once we have these patients fully 
on these four pillars, then uh, we may adjust and we may add medications according to some phenotypes. Let's say we have a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation, then we need to consider the possibility of the joxin or, if appropriate, pul pulmonary vein uh, ablation. In uh, patients who are iron deficient, the ferric and boxing altos, in those with a heart rate greater than 70 beats per minute, ivabradin. So this is a way of uh, getting first the medications are uh, effective in reducing mortality and morbidity immediately at any encounter with all patients. So ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, HGLT2 inhibitors, and then phenotype patients. And according to the phenotype, then basically give the different uh, other additional medications. Now, in order to simplify uh, the way on how we need to treat our patients, with the Heart Failure Association, we produced uh, a companion document to the guidelines that is the patient profiling in patients with heart failure. Basically, we suggest that uh, to look at the four parameters. So the heart rate, the blood pressure, the presence or not of atrial fibrillation, and the, the uh, uh, and the presence or not of CKD. Then we, uh, of course, these patients should receive all the foundation therapy. All patients should re re receive foundation therapy. But then how we adjust the dosage will very much depends on how these factors uh, interact. So let's say we have a patient with, with, uh, with uh, a blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury with uh, a heart rate between 60 and 70. This uh, is a patient where of course, we cannot fully implement the beta blockers. We shouldn't impl fully implement the ACE inhibitors because of the blood pressure effect. So these are patients where that need to take the SGLT2 inhibitors, the MRA, and we may ne need to reduce the diuretic. Then if we have a, another patient that still has a low blood pressure, low heart rate, then you see, of course, there, there is a, we should not continue, uh, we should reduce the beta blocker dose. We should reduce the ACE inhibitors. At the same time, we can easily use and, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, the MRAs. Again, if we have a patient where, uh, uh, um, again, and, and uh, uh, the, there is a, a good blood pressure, as a still low heart rate, then you see that we cannot implement the beta blockers. And when we have fully implemented all the other medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the ACE inhibitors, the MRAs, then we can add varicivas. And uh, if they are on at, um, atrial fibrillation and uh, oral anticoagulant. So that is a way of assessing uh, the how to implement medical therapy. But you can clearly see from how to combine all these uh, uh, that you can always have to uh, and can use and use without any problems are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, we gave also recommendations on uh, in, for pay of the treatment of patients with uh, mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Now, uh, at the time we wrote the guidelines, we had evidence from, uh, um, uh, say, postdoc analysis of studies with ACE inhibitors, ABs, beta blockers, MRAs, and from circuitry valsartan that was basically showed a possi possible benefit on uh, hospitalizations, some effect in, uh, on mortality, that mostly for, say, the, um, the beta blockers and for candesartan, but no effect above 50%. So we have, we gave a 2B recommendation for these classes of drugs. And for patients with preserved ejection fraction, we only suggested to screen, uh, for etiology, for cardiovascular, non cardiovascular comorbidities and to treat them. The four hours, after the publication and the presentation of the guidelines at the uh, ESC Congress, 
the data from Emperor preserved with Emperor Glyphosium were, um, were published, basically showing a reduction in mortality and morbidity with um, uh, Emperor Glyphosium, an effect that was mainly driven by a reduction in uh, hospitalizations. This effect, uh, this effect basically, um, and the, the results put together with the results of the Emperor reduced, demonstrated that the SGLT2 inhibitor is uh, effective across all the different uh, left ventricular uh, functions. And uh, uh, this basically is, uh, shows that the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, gain changes in uh, the treatment of patients with uh, heart failure. Now, more recently, uh, the Hopeless Society of America, where the um, representation of the preserved HF that looked at the effect of tobacco frozen on uh, symptoms and exercise capacity in patients with heart failure and preserved injection uh, fraction. And uh, you can see that, uh, clearly see that in the study, tapagliflozin significantly improved the KCCQ, so the quality of life, and significantly improved the disworked, uh, the six minutes walking uh, a test. What was important is that the data on page to improve or deteriorated, you see that people were not receiving the um, vaccine a significant more deterioration, while patients were uh, received the vaccine significant improvement or very large improvement in their quality of life. So, very significant effect in patients with preserved injection fraction, an effect of tapagliflozin that was maintained across all subgroups of patients at the age, regardless of diabetes, with the rest of the ventricular fraction of the and the I think I think that there's been a, a problem with the, the connection. Yes, can you hear can you hear me now? Professor yes, Rosano? Yes. 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 I don't know up to where uh, you have uh, you've been able to hear me. No, we were able to hear you. Just the last couple of minutes it was uh, we were able to hear you but it was not very clear. But uh, we were able to follow the slides. Okay. But uh, throughout the okay, so right. yeah. Yes. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Cardiology for that very comprehensive overview of uh, heart failure management. Are there any questions from the from the audience? Well, let me just uh, ask you now. When it came to sort of defrosting, it was uh, they you they re, they gave it in the acute stage as well while both the empagliflozin as well as the dapagliflozin was in chronic heart failure. So is there much evidence of both the empagliflozin and dapagliflozin in uh, introducing it early in heart failure? Yes, uh, I mean, basically the, the, the studies with uh, MPA and DAPA were conducted, as you said, in patients with chronic heart failure. But also we have the evidence of those patients who had an hospitalization uh, during uh, the trial with DAPA-HF or, uh, or in MPA reduced, that those patients, were, when they were reintroduced with uh, the um, dapa gliflozin especially, and mpa gliflozin they had a, a better uh, prognosis compared to those who were continued on placebo. So um, uh, basically, put, uh, getting together the data, uh, um, there is a clear evidence that uh, the three drugs that have uh, shown efficacy in uh, uh, patients with chronic heart failure also they can be used immediately after an hospitalization. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Now, uh, 
Let, let's get back to the dates of Arnie, you know, the paradigm heart failure and the pioneer heart failure. All that showed the the uh, sacrificed valsartan was very superior to enalapril. Then subsequently the Paragon trial which came up with uh, no significant benefit and also with the uh, cardase, that is ramipril. But whereas the ejection, when the ejection fraction is low, the ANI was showing much more benefit. And in a, in a, uh, with the new molecule of SGLT2, with a low ejection fraction, how would you, how would you consider to compare these two, two molecules, ANI and SGLT2? Which one you think is better or you think both have to be given in the first instance? Uh, uh, thank you for your question. I mean, it's, uh, of course, these are drugs that have all shown a clear benefit. For circuitous valsartan, we have only one study. And uh, the Pioneer uh, was not a study for mortality and morbidity. It was a study looking all at the uh, nt uh change uh, and showed that it's uh, safe to be used in, uh, um, in patients with... Uh, uh, um, after the acute event. But the, the data we have uh, with the SGLT2 inhibitors are very solid. If you, uh, I showed uh, uh, the spline analysis, the analysis of uh, uh, the benefit of uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction for the SGLT2 inhibitors, and you can clearly see that the benefit is the same, uh, starting with the left ventricular ejection fraction of 15 and ending to 11 trigger ejection fraction of 75. So that is a clear evidence. I think that there's a, uh, it, there's a different uh, way of uh, uh, looking at the uh, patients with uh, heart failure. Of course, we have patients where there's a need for neuro or mono blockade, where the AC inhibitors, the ARNI, the beta blockers, the MRAs work up to a, level, a certain level and trigger ejection fraction. Whilst the SGLT2 inhibitors are different, they have a multiple different uh, mechanism of actions, and they work well all across. So I wouldn't say one or the other. Uh, uh, as we say in the guidelines, we have to use all of them together. <laughs> Regarding the ARNI, they can be, they should be used only in those patients and ACE inhibitor. I'd like to mention the two trials, that's uh, the Victoria and the Galactic Ketchup. Do you actually see us, see them getting into the guidelines at any stage when it comes to Omicabdim, Kabil as well as uh, Versiqua? Yeah, um, Omicabdim, Kabil, Kabil is, very, is a very interesting drug because, you know, it's, um, it's an inotrope that does not increase uh, the uh, energy expenditure, does not increase myocardial ischemia, does not increase, um, um, uh, say, uh, the, the ATP uh, consumption, and uh, also does not change heart rate and blood pressure. And so it's unfortunate that, uh, that it's not yet on the market, but I think it would be a very, very useful drug to be used uh, in uh, those patients who have, uh, say, a low blood pressure, low left ventricular ejection fraction, and we see many in, uh, when we are, that are ready to be discharged. The Verisiguard uh, is a drug that clearly showed a benefit. And uh, I would say that uh, regardless of the fact that it showed a 10% uh, reduction in, uh, in events, it did show that the uh, actually the absolute benefit was similar of the one, the absolute risk reduction was similar to the one that you can see with uh, circuitry valsartan. So is a drug that now there is a new study that is ongoing, that is the Victor study, that uh, will uh, confirm hopefully the benefit of uh, this drug and uh, um, we will have an update of the guidelines in, um, uh, in two years. And uh, by then, I'm confident that we'll have both drugs uh, included. Uh, uh, and I have to say, the um, Verisiwat is already there. In interest of time, we will move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor David.